So here's a question about banked curves, including the ideal banking speed, as well as what to do with friction. In fact, I'll do part B in a couple different ways to show how the algebra will go, depending on the method and approach you choose. But the whole situation is thus, right? You're on the racetrack,、uh, you're trying to round a corner, and you're approaching at fairly high speed, right? Normally, if it's on flat ground, you would have to rely on friction to provide for your inward centripetal acceleration, which is v squared over r. But these bank curves. The ground is not horizontally flat. If you look at the cross section here, which is the dimension where all the interesting things happens, you see that the ground is tilted over, and you can see the say the back of the car going into the page like that. Even though the ground is tilted, though, you're still traveling in sort of a horizontal circle. So the acceleration centripetal is still going to be horizontally inwards. And what the tilting of the road then does is it bends over the normal force, which is always perpendicular to the ground itself, providing for some inward components of this normal force to help us with our centripetal acceleration. So that's the whole reason of these bank curves. Part A deals with the ideal banking speed. So in the case of ideal banking, this arrangement and the fact that you're Road is tilted allows for a specific speed at which no friction is required between the ground and the tires in order to keep you traveling in that constant circle, or at least part of the circle for the turn. And that's totally legit because since we're dealing with rolling tire, we're dealing with static friction. So as long as we're less than or equal to mu s f n, f f could totally be zero, and it totally satisfies everything. So for the case of the ideal banking speed, this one we derived in class already, so you can just use it straight off the bat. But it's basically solving the whole situation with no friction included, and we'll see why it's important to know this speed as we head into part B. But it is the square roots of g times r times tan theta, and that this is just calculator work, really. In this case, theta is seventeen degrees. Gives us pretty much exactly 15 meters per second. Now, what does this have to do with our actual car in this situation when we head into Part B? Well, when we head into Part B, we're told that we have a certain race car on this curve, traveling at a particular speed that is not 15 meters per second. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that friction is no longer zero. Friction is a non-zero number, and it's our job to find out what friction is. And again. Since we're talking about ff is less than or equal to mu s f n static friction, we can't just find f n and then multiply some、um, coefficient of friction and then find say that's f f. We have to solve for f f as an independent number. But as we try to draw our free body diagram, the question then is which direction does friction act? We know that the friction acts parallel to the ground here. So it's either down the slope and in, or out the slope and out. Which one is it? Well, that's why we did the whole calculation with the ideal case. The ideal case is the no friction case that we compare against. In the world of no friction, in order to have no friction, you need to be going at exactly 15 meters per second. So in our case, our actual speed is less than our ideal speed. We're going too slow, actually. So. Without friction, we would actually slide inwards into the center of the、uh, curve. There, as a result, friction is going to try to pull us back out. So it's not this one, and friction acts in that way. This is why heading into most bank curve problems with friction, it is important to work out and check this ideal speed and compare to therefore know which direction does the friction force act. The algebra doesn't allow us just to assume one direction and somehow the negative kind of works out. It doesn't work like that. You have to kind of find out the friction direction using the ideal speed first in order to proceed. So now that we know that we are actually too slow, we know which direction draw friction. We can complete our free body diagram. Let's redraw the whole thing just to clean things up a bit. So now we're talking about part B. Now you're still looking at 
in this bank curves. Your forces is mg, fn, and in this case, your friction force is along the, the curve, along the bank, but outwards like that. In choosing a corner system to analyze all this stuff, the usual thing to do is we favor lining up our corner system with the acceleration. And in this case, once again, our acceleration, based on our path that we're traveling, is actually horizontal. Despite how much this looks like a inclined plane kind of problem, the car isn't just sliding on this ramp look like thing. There's a whole circle that is going through and being in a circular motion at a constant speed, no less. We have centripetal acceleration in the radial direction like that. So the preference, therefore, is to set our axes horizontal to line up with the acceleration. The tangential goes with the velocity, which is in this case into the page, which we draw circle X. And then the third dimension we call Z. Once again, you could use X and Y. They're just labels. Based on this, we have AR, which is that. We can actually work that out as a number because we're told that we have 12 meters per second. And then our turn radius here is 75 meters. And so using the calculator, you get a pretty neat number. AZ, the car is going to continue in the horizontal plane, not moving up, not moving down. So there's no acceleration there. And the tangential speed must be zero because you have a constant speed. The speed isn't increasing or decreasing. And that assures us that the friction purely acts on the plane that's drawn. There's no tangential component to the friction speeding up or slowing down the car. From this point on, we can then work out the friction force, writing down our sum of forces equation. With these corner system, of course, we're again decomposing our Fn and our FF, but not our Mg, because our Mg goes straight up and down in the Z axis. So if we look at the sum of forces in the R direction, we have both of these actually, uh, FF in this case points outward, so that's negative. There's the cosine theta. This theta, of course, is the same as that theta, and this theta is the same as that theta. You can kind of work it out uh, carefully using geometry, or you can sort of notice that that is clearly the smaller of the two angles. Plus Fn sine theta, right? That's this component right over here. So you go to MAR, right? Everything that's inwards is positive. Everything that's outward is negative. Now this equation, even though we know A, we actually have two unknowns. We don't know FF, we don't know Fn. So we're going to need to pull another equation somewhere to hopefully combine these. So we have in the z direction, we can say that, oh, this also has three terms, right? It's not simply Fn, it's just equal to mg or mg cos theta, anything like that. You have to write all the forces based on your free body diagram to see what is it, what does the net force turns out to be, right? So you got Fn cosine theta positive because it's upwards. The FF is also has a positive upward component in this case. And that's sine theta minus mg. It's equal to m times az, which is zero. So that whole thing is equal to zero. Now you have two equations. So you can solve for your two unknowns. Depending on what your favorite method is, um, you can certainly take the one equation and isolate for, say, fn, so we can sub it in and get rid of it, right? Once we know what fn is, we can sub it in here, and everything's a okay. Doing a little algebraic rearrangement, we have fn is equal to plus mg minus ff sine theta, and then the whole thing divides by cosine theta, right? And this is the whole thing that we'll replace in there. So because the expressions are a bit longer, let's proceed slowly. So we'll rewrite the whole equation again. That's minus ff cosine theta plus Fn sine theta is equal to mar. Then the only thing we're doing is we're replacing Fn. So keeping everything else the same, right? Do proceed slowly when the expression gets lengthier. And we replace this whole thing in there. And don't forget the sine theta. Sometimes people often leave this behind because they wrote a big giant thing. But we're just replacing the Fn part of that whole thing, right? Fn being the magnitude of the normal force. And we got some algebra to, to work with. Uh, we're trying to solve for FF, so we expand all the terms, make sure everything with FF stays on one side, everything without goes on the other side. 
we'll expand and separate out these two terms first. And at this point, really, it looks like the sine and cosine things won't neatly cancel out unless you're really good with your trick identities. I would really just punch a number of things into the calculator just to make the expression a little bit easier to manipulate. Theta being 17 degrees, of course, we can then sum in a bunch of things, right? Mass, we're told what the mass is. And we worked out what the centripetal acceleration is earlier. I'm trying to squeeze this down here. Right, these are just calculator work. And then we can collect like terms, right? This looks, you know, lots of decimal lengthy, but it's not a super difficult algebraic expression to manipulate. We combine the two FF terms, they're both negative, so the number gets bigger or rather, more negative. And because it's negative, I'm going to swing it on the other side and swing um, the 6700 the over on to the left-hand side, giving us that much. Right, does it make sense? As a bit of an extra check, you can double check and see that the static friction coefficient required is not ridiculous, so this is a little bit of an extra check. But, we don't know what Fn is, right? Fn is not straightforward. It ends up being, as we were subbing in, this lengthier expression. But again, you just punch it all in. We have all the numbers now. So the static coefficient friction turns out it just needs to be more than about 0.1, which is very reasonable for any rubber tire on asphalt, pavement, kind of racetrack. Now I did say I was going to do this in an alternate way for part B, just to show you a different way of getting the uh, the same thing. Because you, you're noticing that the algebra was a bit lengthier and involved here. So as a alternative way, the organization is as such. So we still have the same free body diagram, right? And we still have the same acceleration. But now, the insights comes in, instead of following our axes with the acceleration, we have freedom to choose any axes and the sum of forces equal ma will still apply. But in this case, the unknown is not the acceleration. The unknown is the friction and the Fn. So if we choose another axis that doesn't involve decomposing those unknown forces, our lives would actually be a little bit easier. So this requires a little bit of mental extension, let's say, instead of decomposing the forces, we're going to have to actually decompose the acceleration. So to try and keep axes in line with Fn and Fn, we would use axes like these. I can call that X and Y, let's say. And then the thing we decompose, yeah, we decompose all the forces, which in this case we do decompose Mg, but we, we would also have to decompose the acceleration into its x and y component. In fact, we can just look at the x component in this case, because we're just interested in ff, and that's the only place where it would appear. So ax in this case would be your ar, this is theta, so that's cosine 17 degrees. And by choosing these axes, we have kind of separated the fn and the ff, our two unknowns, into the two separate equations. So if we just are interested in the FF, we could just look at the uh, X direction equation. But I will still write down the Y direction equation. Then the thing that I want to note here is that while this expression looks very much like an inclined plane question, what prevents you from saying that they're the same thing? Because they're not, is that the acceleration in the Y direction is not actually zero. There is a, a non-zero y component of the acceleration happening here. So Fn is not going to be equal to mg cosine 17 degrees. So don't take these mental shortcuts. Always write out your sum of forces equal ma in any situation, and that will always be true. In any case, we're just interested in our FF. So let's just, FF, which is negative, by the way, because it's uh, opposite my x direction as defined. So I swing that on to the other side, giving me 
minus max is equal to ff. And that's it. We can just plug everything in. This first term becomes that minus that number, and we get exactly the same answer as the previous case. So just a different way of saying the problems to, again, make our lives easier algebraically, and we always have freedom to do that. And so this hopefully gives you some food for thought and gives you a rundown on the general procedure of dealing with our bank curves with friction.